I'm Bobby Olmshipman, President and CEO of St. Luke's South Hospital, and I'm honored to serve as the 2020 Chairman of the Board of Directors for the Overland Park Chamber. The Chamber exists to make Overland Park prosper, so it's logical that one of our year's highlights is today's event, which celebrates Mayor Gerlach, the City Council, and the City's professional staff, the accomplishments of an excellent year. We look forward to hearing about the exciting strategies they have planned for our community in 2020. First, I'd like to thank today's presenting sponsor, my organization, St. Luke's Health System. It's a unique opportunity to be the chairman as well as the sponsor of the signature event. And I am proud that St. Luke's partners with the chamber for this event each year in recognition of our longstanding partnership with the city of Overland Park and our residents. The city's strategic commitment to quality of life has been beneficial for St. Luke's, as it has been for all the other businesses in this room. And we're proud to continue our investment in Overland Park. I invite the team from St. Luke's Health System to stand and be recognized. At this time, I'd also like to recognize the Chamber's 2020 corporate partners, Advent Health, Black & Veatch, Central Bank of the Midwest, Empower Retirement, HCA Midwest Health, Menorah Medical Center, Overland Park Regional Medical Center, and Sprint. Would representatives from these companies please stand and be recognized? I'd also like to thank our 2020 corporate sponsors. Representatives from these companies, please stand to be recognized as your company is announced. Affinis Corp, Community America Credit Union, Evergy, FNBO, First National Bank, Folsom Siefkin, J.E. Dunn Construction Company, Johnson County Community College, Kansas Gas Service, McCown-Gordon Construction, St. Luke's Health System, the University of Kansas Edwards Campus, and the University of Kansas Health System. Please join me in thanking them. I'd also like to thank and recognize our 2020 Leadership Circle sponsor, Adams Gabbard. Would representatives of Adams Gabbard please stand and be recognized. We are honored to have many elected officials in attendance today, and I'd ask that all Johnson County officials stand and be recognized, which includes elected officials from the Federal Delegation, staff, Johnson County Commission, Johnson County Community College, Johnson County Sheriff, Water One Board, Overland Park City Council, DeSoto City Council, Blue Valley Board of Education, Shawnee Mission Board of Education, our neighboring city councils and school boards. Thank you for your public service and for joining us today. And now to our program. It is my pleasure to introduce Overland Park Mayor Carl Gerlach to present his 2020 State of the City Address. Carl Gerlach began his service as Ward 3 Council Member in 1995 and was first elected mayor in April of 2005. He's been re-elected as mayor three times since then, most recently in 2017. Mayor Gerlach received, has received numerous awards recognizing his leadership, ethics, and commitment to diversity. Most notably, he's received the NAACP Martin Luther King Jr. Legacy Award the Ewing Kaufman Distinguished Eagle Scout Award, and the Crescent Peace Society's 2013 Peace Award. We know him as a leader who has a vision for our city that is welcoming, prosperous, and is responsive to the needs of our citizens and business community. We are thankful for both his commitment to our community and for his partnership with us. Please help me welcome to the stage Mayor Carl Gerlach. Very nice. Take it from here, sir. Thank you, Bobby. Right. Appreciate it. How about those Chiefs? Yeah. 
I just want to congratulate Coach Andy Reid and the Super Bowl MVP Patrick Mahomes, his teammates, and the entire Kansas City, uh, Kansas City Chiefs team, the entire organization for their intentional leadership and the results they had from them. Let's show one more thank you to, the, to everybody in the, in the world champion Kansas City Chiefs. Good afternoon, and Bobby, thank you very much for that nice introduction, and welcome to everyone here today. I want to extend a personal thank you to the St. Luke's Health System for being today's sponsor. I also want to uh, introduce to the entire Convention Center team, I don't think they're still here, but I want to say thank you very much for their outstanding service. Hopefully you enjoyed your lunch today. Many say that government serves best when it's closest to the people. Well, I totally agree with that, and I'd like to recognize my city council colleagues. If you could hold your applause until the end. Council members, please stand up when I introduce your name, and, and uh, we'll applaud at the end. First in Ward 1, Council Member Logan Healy and Holly Grummert. Ward 2, Council Members Kurt Skoog and Paul Lyons. Ward 3, Council Members Jim Kite and Tom Kerrigan. Ward 4 Council Members, Council President Fred Spears and Gina Burke. And Ward 5 Council Members John Thompson and Ferris Ferrisati. Along with Ward 6, Chris Newland and Scott Hamlin. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Family is also very important to me. And it's important to all of us here today. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize my wife, Jill. She gives me that energy and that strength that I need to get through. Jill, thank you very much. I also want to thank my son, Chris, and daughters, Jennifer and Katie, for being here and their years of laughter and hugs and smiles that they give me and help me get it through the day. Also, my son-in-law, Ryan, is here today but my daughter-in-law, Lindsay, couldn't make it. She's home with the two most important people, more important than any of you in the room, <laughs> my two granddaughters. <laughs> so, you know, we're celebrating Overland Park's 60th anniversary this year. So what's an anniversary without gifts? To celebrate the 60th anniversary today, please pick up a tree seedling. I think I got an example right here. On your way out, if you pick up one of these tree seedlings, because our goal this year is to plant 6,000 trees to celebrate our 60th anniversary. So please pick one on your way, on your way out. <clears throat> we will be having activities all summer long to you, that you can celebrate our 60th anniversary. Go to the website, you can learn a whole lot more about all those events going on this summer. Overland Park's history of decisions and actions have been due to intentional leadership. Intentional leadership has contributed to the success of this community, including the many attributes cited for our success. Attributes such as health and safety, education and childcare, affordability, strong community relations, quality of life, and so much more. These are just a few of the characteristics that have brought us national acclaim. Some of my favorite awards from last year include, we were chosen as the number one best city in the nation to raise a family. We, were, we have the best real estate markets. We have most livable mid-sized cities in Overland Park. And we have so many more awards that we received. But awards are nice, but the attributes that lead to them don't just happen. They require intentional leadership. For us, that's 60 years of intentional leadership. I once heard someone say, while other cities are playing checkers, Overland Park plays chess. You know, I love this game. It's taught me a lot about calculation, anticipation, and well, 
life itself. Agreed, my friend. It's a process of uh, identifying pitfalls and looking for a pathway to success. Not unlike growing a city or a county. One should never move hastily, but rather calculate the long-term effect of each move. Fortunately, we've been blessed with a long line of residents, elected officials, and city staff who've made winning moves. Though sometimes I have to remind myself that small setbacks don't necessarily mean defeat. True, but I've heard it said that one bad move can nullify several good moves. And I've heard it said, the world is full of players. The trick is to be a game changer. I think you know, if you want to be a game changer, thinking two or three steps ahead is not enough. Overland Park, Johnson County, and our other cities have prided themselves on thinking five or six steps ahead. That's still our goal, Ed, as a community, a council, and a city. It's a tremendous responsibility. You're not only charged with acting in people's best interest, you're also charged with acting in the best interest of generations to come. And the game is always getting more complex. Tomorrow's moves may not have even been created yet. It's about listening to the community, evaluating concerns, and finding solutions. Just like chess, planning for the future requires you to be far-sighted. This year, Carl, would be a good time for 2020 vision. Yeah. Ed, checkmate. More than 30 years ago, when Overland Park Mayor Ed Eilert and the City Council identified a need to invest in downtown Overland Park, there were vacant storefronts, diminishing customer foot traffic, and declining retail sales. We had a strategic discussions with the business owners and residents, resulting in very intentional moves to change the trajectory of downtown Overland Park. The Downtown Development Plan, the creation of the Business Improvement District, adoption of Vision Medcalf, approval of a form-based code, and others were all part of the processes to create the growing and thriving downtown that we see today. Improvements to the streetscape, the Clock Tower, Mad Ross Community Center, Farmers Market, and Thompson Park are all examples of successful public investments. These projects were a prelude to significant private investments in downtown. Our residents and your workforce told us that they want choices. They want choices of how they live. They want choices of how they'll work. And they want choices of how they'll spend their leisure time. Now they have options. They have options between traditional quality suburban lifestyle or a new level of achievement with everything in one location. Simply put, city leaders have made choices, intentional choices throughout Overland Park's history, setting the stage for the future. The expansion of US 69 is one of those choices. We all get it. It's our top priority for us and for you. We, your governing body, city manager Bill Ebel, public works director Tony Hoffman, the chamber's board of directors, Tracy Osborne Olchin, and her team are all knocking on doors, texting representatives at the federal and state level to tell them it's your priority. Most of you are among the thousands who drive it every day. US 69 is the most traveled four-lane highway in Kansas, including I-70 or I-35. Currently, 
the early estimate is it will cost $300 million to pay for the completion to completely rebuild 69 Highway and add two additional lanes in either direction from 103rd Street down to 151st Street. The reality is that Kansas Department of Transportation doesn't have sufficient funds for all the requested improvements across the entire state. Communities can offer accelerated and accelerate their projects by providing some level of matching funds. Historically, Overland Park has done so. Matter of fact, over the past 20 plus years, we have intentionally invested $61 million in US 69 related transportation projects. The city, along with KDOT, funded the US 69 preliminary concept study to identify potential solutions to address the current needs that we have. In a few minutes, KDOT Secretary Julie Lorenz will join me, Nick Haynes, for further discussion of US 69. So let's talk a little bit about jobs. Corporates, corporations evaluate business locations considering many economic factors, including the availability of a workforce talent, whether there's a pro-business environment or a good transportation network. Overland Park wasn't always prime choice for these companies. If you look back into the 1960s and 70s and early 80s, we were considered a bedroom community. Translation, Overland Park didn't have enough quality jobs to keep residents from driving to other metropolitan communities to go to work. Now, through intentional and visionary leadership and a long history of partnerships with businesses in Overland Park, Overland Park is a major employment center for the metropolitan area and the state of Kansas. Development of the College Boulevard corridor brought jobs and the economic strength to our city. More than 33,000 jobs are within a one mile radius of the intersection of College and Medcalf, making us and downtown Kansas City the prevailing job centers in the entire metropolitan area. We've seen imp impressive job growth over the decades along with investments. Matter of fact, 2019 was the second highest year for public and private investment. And in 2019, after it was the second best, 2018 was even better because it had over $800 million, where 2019 only had $700 million. But two fantastic years of construction valuation added to our community. But this didn't happen by accident. It happened because our city leaders worked with business community to create a culture that welcomes investment in our community. You know, we are quickly approaching 200,000 residents. Our labor force has increased due to our steadily growing population. This increase has amounted to over 7,000 additional jobs in our community during just the past five years. People are attracted to great jobs and they're, they're attracted to our great quality of life in Overland Park. Our private and public partnership brings benefits, including demand for housing, products, sales, and services from you, the business community. New jobs and new residents also increase the tax base which helps everyone, including our schools, Johnson County, the state, and of course, the city of Overland Park. It's crucial that we remain a community of choice for residents and businesses for new jobs. We do not, we need to do that by never losing sight of our duty to be physically responsible. Now, I wanna make it clear, we do not ever put Overland Park's finances at risk. Ever. Period. Beth Johnson will be joining me 
on this panel discussion about the chamber plays, playing an instrumental role in attaining and re retaining and attracting these jobs and these companies. Overland Park has exacting requirements for development, enough so that some companies choose to move to other cities. Requirements involve numerous public discussions at scheduled meetings, which are open to the public. We encourage the community engagement. Every public-private partnership has been discussed at public council meetings. We are intentional about community engagement. Matter of fact, Overland Park was created as a result of community engagement. Voters cast ballots to officially incorporate the city of Overland Park 60 years ago. Since then, our community has engaged to shape Vision Medcalf, future road projects, downtown Overland Park, park improvements, and Forward OP. Forward OP is one of the most visible demonstrations of how our community came together and engaged. As a result, 1,200 people came to numerous public meetings to share their thoughts in person. 5,000 comments were received online and at open houses and meetings. We were intentional about talking to groups beyond the expected participants, including high school and college students, young adults just beginning their careers in our community, parents of growing families, diverse populations, and many more. Forward OP is a community plan. This like other public endeavors, is what we strive for, a community-driven plan. To have a voice, you have to want to participate. Your personal commitment will benefit the entire Overland Park, so please get involved. The Chamber, Visit Overland Park, and the City are all contributing funds and in-kind support and services to implement the strategy Highlights from it include community gathering space for events, affordable housing, being a leading education center, and so much more. Forward OP is a blueprint. It's a blueprint for action. Now also we are very fortunate to have nationally ranked schools in Overland Park. Blue Valley incoming superintendent Tanya Merrigan and Overland Park Fire Chief Brian Diener will join me and Nick and others to discuss the new education initiative and partnership. Matter of fact, this is probably a good time to introduce Nick and have him join me up here. I want to tell you a little bit about him as he comes up. Nick has headed up KCPT's Public Affairs Division for the past 20 years. He has earned three three regional Emmy Awards, most recently for his coverage of mental health issues. He is best known to host the weekly primetime public affairs program, Kansas City, A Week in Review. Nick is a former BBC radio news reporter, which you'll realize real soon. He was born and raised in Port Talbot, South Wales, in a steel town that also produced actors Richard Burton and Anthony Hopkins. And we got the best of all three right here. Prior to joining KCPT, Nick served as news director for KANU and NPR affiliate in Lawrence, Kansas, and was state bureau chief for Kansas Public Radio in Topeka. Nick, please join me up here. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you for the introduction, Nick. Thank like, you. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you laying out all of your priorities for this upcoming year in the city of Overland Park. Surprisingly, though, you didn't mention the biggest economic development project in the history of Overland Park. Have you seen this, ladies and gentlemen? We are talking about Overland Park 2038, the Olympic bid. Oh, you went away. You've seen these t-shirts around town. Now, how is that bid going, uh, Mayor Gerlach? It's, it's going very well, Nick. You, you know that came out of the Forward OP discussions, and it's a great plan. But I don't know if we got some work to do. I'm assuming 
that the athletes will be in downtown Overland Park and they'll be fed by the new Strang Hall, food hall that you have there. Exactly, we've okay. got that plan. And I'm assuming also that the swimming events will be at the Matt Ross Community Center. Correct. What I'm not gauging right now is where the track and field and basketball games in those Olympics will take place. Well, we've got two great community centers right here. We'll just hold them there. All righty. Uh, we also have, by the way, looking at 2038, you can have lots of competition, Los Angeles, Paris, Rome, Brisbane, Australia, with the new ice rink uh, coming in at Prairie Fire. Would you entertain moving this to a Winter Olympics bid, Meg Rulak? Well, I think that's a good idea, but just think if it's a day like today, <laughs> we could just have the fire department pour water on okay. the streets and we'd have a great ice oh, rink. Oh, wow, all right, that's a cool thing. We're going to lift up the hood on some of your major priorities. If, can we do that? We're going to sure. bring up some industry experts uh, with us. Uh, you mentioned all of these 200,000 people in Overland Park who you're benefiting. Let's lift the hood. Um, one of those is the project that relates to putting toll lanes on one of our city's busiest highways. We have the head of the Kansas State Transportation Department with us, Julie Lorenz. Uh, as Overland Park works to find new companies to come to the city and work to make sure those who are already here don't leave, Beth Johnson from the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce is with us. And the fire department is building its latest, greatest fire station at a high school. Is it innovative, risky, bold, perplexing, all four? Well, fire chief uh, Brian Adena is with us, uh, the incoming Blue Valley School District Hi, superintendent who said yes to this unusual partnership. Tonya Merrigan, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for being with us. Uh, I have to say, let, let's start with the toll road issue, because while we were celebrating Thanksgiving, there was a front page story, multiple TV news reports, about Kansas adding a toll road on 69 Highway. Don't we love that word, toll? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, Julie Lorenz, first of all, we're talking about 69 Highway. Carl Gurlach, the mayor, just said, this was the busiest highway in the entire state of Kansas, really? It is. Uh, it is the busiest four-lane highway. Okay, so if you're on, for example, 435 and we have more lanes, you might have more traffic. But in terms of congestion on a four-lane, worst in the state, in fact, I'll put it out there, it gets a grade of an F today, and it gets worse in the future if we don't do something about it. Tanya, we don't like those grades, we do, do we? We do not like those. <laughs> and nobody's, we, nobody's going for an F in Overland Park. We, uh, in the media, can often exaggerate things, and so we see the word toll, and we want to make big stories about that, and it gets lots of attention, because people don't like tolls. But is that just one option, or is that the option that's being considered by the state at this time? So I'm happy to explain. This was, last year was a fantastic demonstration of how democracy works really well. So the bill that we took to the legislature got worked over time and time again. We put lots of good checks and balances into the expanded tolling legislation. And the way it works is that if a community is interested in tolling itself, they can bring that idea forward to CADA. We'll do a feasibility study together to see if it even makes sense. If it does, then a proposal is put forward to KTA and then to the legislature. So it's not pushed down anybody's throat. It's if you want to do it. And the reason you might want to do it, that you might want to toll a new lane, is so that we can build that lane faster, sooner. Okay? So it's not pushed upon you, but because we don't have enough money to build new facilities every place everybody wants them, if you can bring a little money to the table, then we can build your project faster. So it could be a tool to use to get a project done sooner, or you could use other revenue streams. Now, many of us, of course, travel into other parts of Kansas. We may be going off to Colorado, to Topeka. We go through tolls. We see those tolling booths there that we go through. Would it work the same way here? No. Okay. No, because it's the additional lane. And you know that saying, like, a picture's worth a thousand words? I bet a video is worth more. One of the most effective techniques for reducing traffic delays and getting you where you need to be when you need to be there is something called express lanes. An express lane can be what you want it to be. It's a lane that expands the capacity of the highway and manages the congestion of the lane through tolling. Express lanes are built in addition to the existing general purpose lanes, 
providing drivers the choice of using the new lane. Here in Colorado, express lanes are typically on the far left inside lanes and either separated by a concrete barrier or a solid white stripe. The lanes can be entered at the designated areas, shown either with a break in the barrier or with dotted lines. Overhead signs will tell you exactly how much your trip will cost. Toll prices can change depending on congestion. For example, increased toll prices during peak morning or evening traffic to ensure the lane remains a free-flowing alternative for travelers at all times. There are many ways to use express lanes depending on your commuting habits. Okay, so the regular lanes that we currently have are gonna be the same. Free. Free, it's just this extra lane. Yes. All lanes. What would happen Twice. though if the city did absolutely nothing whatsoever, Julie? Well, okay, so good question. But I wanna go back to the word choice. You talked about it. Mm -hmm. That express lane, if you wanna get in that lane, it's your choice. The two lanes that you drive in for free, air quotes, because the reality is there's nothing really free. Your taxes have paid for those lanes. It's the additional lane, if you wanted to get in it, that you would be able to go at nearly full speed, depends on how much traffic there is, so you are paying so that you can go fast. And we all know time is money. So that's the idea is to manage the congestion. Now, your question was, what if we don't do anything? Well, the reality is next Tuesday, in both House Appropriation and Ways and Means, we'll be bringing forward the new transportation program Right now, we have no projects in our pipeline as a state. We have $435 million worth of delayed T-Works projects that need to be built primarily in the rural areas, and we will honor that commitment. Beyond that, nothing in the pipeline. It is not a good place for our state to be. 69 is not in the pipeline, neither are projects in Wichita or anywhere else. We need to pass that program, then we can start talking about next projects. But if the city was to do nothing and we don't pass the program, nothing happens. F gets worse to I don't know what. <laughs> but there is the view, though, that people say, well, why is the state funding all of this? Oh, but the state does. This is a partnership where the city, and for a long time, has brought some money to the table. The state would still pay for the bulk of the construction and the maintenance. And think about it. You can't collect a toll till you're driving on it, right? So we would build it and then collect a portion of the cost of the construction and the maintenance. And that's what changed last year. Our toll policy was established in 1953. And it called for the toll to cover the construction, the design, the construction, the right of way, and the maintenance. There are very few places in America that have enough traffic and none in Kansas that you could create a whole new facility. Meg would like. I think I think the bottom line is if I have learned enough from Julie, we have about two and a half years left of T-Work projects still in the, ready to go that we have to fund. And then if we don't do something unique and different like tolling, then we may have to wait 10 or 13 or 14 years before we get 69 expanded. And can we do that? I don't think so. You also highlighted in your speech another section of what's important to Overland Park is to try and bring in and retain the companies that you already have in Overland Park. And actually, that's part of your job, Beth Johnson, with the Overland Park Chamber of Commerce. Now, we often get this impression that the way we recruit and retain businesses is that we get the biggest bag of cash we possibly can find and lop it in front of the eyes of the CEO of a company. Is there more to it than that, Beth? There's a lot more to it than that, Nick. However, I am hoping that these are money trees that the okay. mayor is giving okay. out afterwards. What um, gifts that we would help. today? Yeah. That would be great. Um, but in all actuality, the mayor mentioned a few factors that are extremely important to businesses. Quality of life, education, um, transportation access, which we've just talked about as well, workforce, uh, real estate, all of those factors. About number seven or 10 on a survey that's done every year from um, Area Development Magazine is where you'll find corporate tax rate and incentives. In economic development, we often refer to incentives as the cherry on top. It's the little piece, last piece of the puzzle that can make the difference between one community or the other. But from an economic development standpoint, we would tell you if you could get rid of all incentives, that would be great. But if we were to do that and disarm just in Overland Park, we'd be taking a knife to a gunfight and that wouldn't be any good for any of us. However, we are very careful about the incentives we do. And I will give some kudos to the mayor um, for his efforts if you want to look at just the border war. 
The mayor and others in the area led a charge to make sure that as the border war discussion in the media played out was mostly about state incentives, we led the charge for local incentives and for leveling the playing field between what Kansas City, Missouri could do, especially in a tax abatement uh, situation versus what Overland Park could do or the Kansas side uh, communities because they could give an incentive for 25 years. We're capped at 10. So that was a charge to lead um, the organizations through leadership and intentionality to make sure that we leveled that playing field that made a difference in our area for our communities and for our business. What happens when you have big companies like Woodell and Reed that have been in Overland Park for almost 30 years and then decides they're going to move over, cross over to the other state line to get the incentives over there? Does that have you lying awake at night in a fetal position? Has me uh, on the floor. As it attributes to the gray hairs that okay. grow in my head. Yes, it does. Um, it's never a good situation. However, we're not in charge of the company. Companies can make their own decisions. The, but what we can do is to make sure that we have the best possible location for them to hopefully stay in our community. But when it does happen and they choose to leave, what it gives us is an opportunity to repurpose maybe a, a part of the um, office space and to recruit a new company in to that space. Something you also didn't mention in your speech, Maker, like was the word Sprint. And that's obviously big in the headlines this week with the judge sort of laying the groundwork for T-Mobile to take over that company. I have to say, when that was first sort of being thought about, you were running for re-election, you were on a program, mm -hmm. and I was amazed that you were like cool as a cucumber. I was expecting more outrage, dis uh, unbelievability that all of this was happening, but you didn't seem to be too bent out of shape about that. And, and I'm still not bent out of shape. We have a great working relationship with Sprint. When you look at, they've talked about bringing a thousand new jobs to the Overland Park campus. They've talked about reinvesting in the buildings to upgrade the buildings. But most importantly, they bring 5G. By the combination of T-Mobile and Sprint, we get 5G expanded and hopefully here in the town and across the entire country. Those are all very good positives and that's why we're very comfortable with Sprint. Governing Magazine, and you mentioned by the way that uh, this was all, often viewed as a bedroom community. That right. was Overland Park. You were sending all of your workers someplace <laughs> else. And, uh, but Governing Magazine said the secret sauce, the secret ingredient for any company trying to, uh, community trying to bring in new jobs is to find the figuring out your unique selling point. Beth, what is the unique selling point for you when you try to sell Overland Park to, to businesses? Well, every community says that quality of life is your, community, is your unique selling point. However, we can actually prove that. Um, so we can actually prove our education rates, um, our taxing being lower than any other first class city in the uh, state of Kansas and anywhere in the metro community. One of the things that we do, though, is make sure that our citizens are protected. So a lot of times what comes out is the taxpayer funds are going to fund you know, these projects and things like that, and that's not true. This is new money that comes into our community. Um, I, I, wanted, I think it's more clearly represented if we give an example. So let's talk about an example in Overland Park where our community and our citizens and our elected officials made the decision to invest in a building. So let's look at the Overland Park International Trade Center. And everyone probably can remember in this room what that looked like. And thanks to Occidental Management, they uh, redeveloped that building and Black and & Veatch, um, the players all came together at the right point where Black & Veatch was needing a, a location for two of their um, um, Divisions. Divisions, thank you, Mayor. And was looking for a space to put those together and Occidental um, owned a building that could work for that. And so before um, that building was purchased, the taxes on that building were $620,000. Today, with a 50% tax abatement for Black and Beach, which actually is only 14.8% in actuality because it's only on the uh, square footage that they occupy, that building pays $1.36 million in taxes. That's a 119% increase. And I'm not a banker, but I'm pretty sure any banker in this room would take that return on investment or anyone who's investing their funds in a project. But there, now, is, yes. there is the view, though, that when you're putting in tax incentives, somebody else loses, and we've seen it in our community and on the, on the Missouri side. If you're bringing in a big business, they get all of these tax incentives, and then it's viewed that schools are going to miss out and libraries are going to miss out. Are you concerned about that loss of tax revenue, Tony American? We know that... All schools know that business development, economic development is important to a community. It's all about balance, Nick. Um, our community does a good job looking at balance, and we will need to continue to do that. 
Teva Pharmaceuticals was another company that moved from the Missouri side of the state line to a gorgeous facility at Norland College Boulevard. That was back in 2013. Lots of tax incentives mm. to do that. Awesome. 10 million from the city of Overland Park. That was 2013. Now they're gone. They're off to New Jersey. Do but, you, when they claim though that they're going to get the money though, and they're going to create jobs and they're going to have this type of salary, do you come back to them and try and claw some of that money back? We sure do. Okay. We sure do. Um, that's an interesting story. But thanks for that memory, because Teva was one of my first projects when I came to Overland <laughs> Park. So, uh, while it didn't quite work out the way we wanted it to, it is a success story in the end. So, back in 2012, when Teva was looking for a new location, that piece of property paid $12.65 in taxes. $12.65. We made an agreement, went through the public process, like every project does. It's very open and transparent to the community. And Teva built a new building with the help of uh, Block Real Estate Development, moved into the building. They had promised that they would keep a minimum of 240 jobs. They have to do a yearly um, um, update to the city to make sure that those numbers and that they meet those projections. They were actually at 400 jobs uh, when the company changed hands and decided that, you know, this facility, even though we were the most, uh, the best facility that Teva had anywhere in their production, uh, line and in their offices, they decided that this wasn't going to be the best location that they were going to need to leave. However, we were very lucky is that we had another company uh, in Overland Park, NetSmart Technologies, was, that was at the other end of the spectrum. They were growing rapidly. They had already filled up one building on College Boulevard, then a second. They were leasing facilities in another building. Um, it was pretty much some discussion, maybe we should rename it NetSmart Technologies Boulevard because they were growing that quickly. But what happened was we went through the process of, as Teva got ready to leave, NetSmart was growing, and so could they overtake uh, the abatement? So the 10-year 50% tax abatement that was originally approved for Teva was transferred through another very public uh, process to NetSmart. So the job numbers changed, where NetSmart now has job numbers that they have to meet and create in, in order to retain that 50% abatement. But what happens then, Teva actually on the space that they occupied during 2019, pays 100% of the property taxes for what they occupied, as well as has to repay the taxing entities from 2014 to 2018 because they didn't meet all the projections. I want to bring in our other guests in a moment, but I do want to ask you this question, because I, I purposely picked the horror stories, of course. Sure, thanks. To pr prod and poke. <laughs> but I did see, I mean, interesting headline just recently about A Place for Mom, which is a Seattle-based, largest senior referral service in the in North America, and they're coming to Overland Park. They're gonna to go to the Sprint Campus, at least temporarily. When you were trying to get them to come here, what was that thing that they liked most about being in Overland Park? What was the sell? We have dozens of cities here. They could have gone to Gladstone, or Kansas City, Missouri, or someplace else. They could have, and they looked at all of those communities, too. This was a project that, as they evaluated the entire United States, narrowed down their um, options. They did, it came down to the final in Kansas City uh, metro area as Overland Park or Casey Mo and they loved our community. When they came here and they felt uh, what was available in our community, the love and, and the caring that we had uh, for our community, as well as the amenities that are on the Sprint campus and available to them in the area, that was a selling point for them, and that's what they wanted for their employees. Next up, did we hear that right? Overland Park's next latest and greatest fire station going to be headquartered at a high school the city's newest fire station being built at Blue Valley Southwest High School at 179th and Quivira, a few miles up the road from the Overland Park uh, Arboretum. You know, it used to be that school groups, if you were at a school, you'd go for a field trip, and then maybe the whole day you'd be going off to the fire station. <laughs> when did it get to the point that actually the fire station comes to you? Who hatched up Tony American and Fire Chief this plan to have the fire station actually be at the school? Well, Nick, it started as two, uh, uh, two willing partners. Uh, the city of Overland Park was looking for land to put a fire station in that area, very close to Quivira. Uh, we had had some difficulty with the first couple options and our city manager was creative and approached uh, Superintendent White to tell them our story since they had the corner. And after some uh, fleshing out conversations, it was clear the, the school district had some need and interest to add fire science and EMS education to the very successful CAPS program. So it started from there. I'm assuming, I mean, these are still high school students. They're not going to be out fighting <laughs> fires with your men and women on the Overland Park Fire Department, right? The, the answer is yes. 
uh, there's going to be I said some, it was a risky yeah, plan, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. I mean, but we, we manage risk okay. for a living, uh, yes. But after we, about a year and a half worth of education, uh, much like all the other CAPS programs of immersion, uh, we'll be putting them out in our squad houses and our firehouses for them to really understand what a career is like. If we're a good fit, uh, we'll, we'll put them on the payroll. Does everybody get to take advantage of this program if you're at that high school or anywhere else in the district, Tony American? You, you do. Um, as a high school student, um, you could choose. We're in the process right now of, of out there and, and getting this information out to all of our high school students. Uh, this would be very much like the CAPS program, as, as Chief Diener said. Um, but it fits very well with the plan that we have. We have a partnership with our friends at Johnson County Community College where we are really focusing on high skill, high demand jobs and we know that our um, workforce is changing and that this is just another area uh, that we want to bring to our students to give them that opportunity. Blue Valley has been known for its CAPS program where people go there and they can do everything from aeronautical engineering and the, yes, they might be in a medical situation and they could do teaching even there. Why, why wouldn't you just add a fire instruction, uh, uh, for instance, to your CAPS program and call it quits there? Why did you feel you had to go the extra mile to bring the fire station there? It's the, the high skill, high demand. We want them to have that experience and they, they could sit all day long um, in the CAPS facility and they could do a couple of field trips like you talked about, but to get that hands-on experience and to really know what it would be like to be a firefighter, um, that was the partnership that we, we knew we needed to have. I was just looking at a fire industry newsletter just recently, boning up for this whole experience today. It says, new day in the firehouse. The job of firefighter has changed beyond recognition. It is not easy to do or recruit those necessary to do it. Is having this partnership with all of these young minds an opportunity to then bring recruits into the Oval Park Fire Department? It's essential. Um attracting and retaining like Beth uh, occupational athletes to serve our mission for 35 years that pool is getting smaller and our need is getting larger as we grow and we have retirements so being able to get them early into a track to where they can come out with their merit badges from Johnson County Community College and the state certifications and come out debt free and by that time a paramedic two years from now, more than likely in the metro region, will be hired in the mid 50s. So that's. Yeah. So you, you've got the fire station now coming on board. What's next then, Tony American? Could we now see a police station at a high school, a St. Luke's Hospital emergency room coming into the high school? Perhaps the chief's training camp will move over to the <laughs> school district teaching kids about sports management. Absolutely, bring it on, Nick. We okay. might need to meet afterwards and so you can help me brainstorm some ideas. We're ready. Uh, at our, um, as I was sitting next to Brian at the table, uh, he mentioned he'd be, I said what he'd do beforehand, but he said he'd been fighting fires uh, since he was 17 years old, which I find kind of remarkable. What is the biggest change? All of you have been in, in your respective industries for some time. What is the biggest change today, though, that you're now facing the challenge, Brian, that you weren't when you first started? Uh, challenge, I, I would say our partnerships with uh, the local hospitals, uh, just sitting with the CEO, uh, you know, the number of hospitals, standalone ERs, and our role in uh, logistically moving patients to the right facilities uh, with our talent. So our folks are making decisions as to what critical needs the patient presents and what specialty hospital they need to get to. We do that 80% of our call load is that type of stuff. Julie Lorenz, you're actually leading, of course, the um, State there. Department. You were in there before, though, in a different role, in a senior role. You went back uh, then to Burns and Mac. You were involved in transportation projects. How is it different, though, the challenge today than when you were dealing it the first time with the yeah. Department of Transportation? So the difference is, and it's uh, a challenge and an opportunity, just two sides of the same coin, it's the technology piece. Mm -hmm. It's That's how the express tollings that we were talking about, that's what will allow those to work. There's no longer a need for a toll booth, for example. Um, we can look to the future and look at electric vehicles, which are already available, but we have to look at what that does to our ability to collect gas tax over time. Automated vehicles, driverless vehicles, will be enormous opportunities for moving both people and freight in the long term. So it's the technology piece. And that is why I'll put a push out right now for this community. The leadership role Overland Park takes, the thought leadership role, is so important for our state. I, I can't emphasize that enough. One of the highest educated groups, not only in the state, but in the nation, and the ability here for you all to lead 
sets this community apart. And I very much look forward to talking about transportation in any other venue in which you'll inv invite me. But it's take advantage of the transformational technology that's available, transportation and otherwise. I bet nearly 20 years in economic development, the better part of a decade with Overland Park. When you started to today, what, is, what has been the change for you? I mean, what is the biggest challenge that you didn't deal with when you first started? Well, the biggest challenge is probably workforce um, because it has changed throughout the years. And as you talk about the number of baby boomers that are retiring, what does that generation look like that's taking over um, in their spots? And so as companies, you know, it used to be that companies chose their, uh, lo that location, location, location was top of the list of factors for when companies were evaluating locations. And now it's workforce, workforce, workforce. Is it there now? Is the talent there um, in the pipeline for the future and that kind of stuff? So the education piece of it is extremely important and how quickly can we get them to the job is also important. But that relationship that the business community has with the government officials is extremely important as well because any business that's coming to your community or growing in your community wants to know that, they, that you want them to be there. And the role of a school superintendent has changed dramatically. Now it seems almost all of the headlines are about vaping, bullying, mental illness. The actual uh, academic part seems to have gone uh, down in terms of all these other concerns that you have to deal with. Uh, I think we have to, to uh, deal with all of those things that you just talked about. And academics is still a part of that. Um, but you know, my background is as a, a high school counselor and um, it has continued to be an issue. Uh, so mental health has to be a kind of forefront in the work that we're doing. But academics remain strong and we will continue to produce and um, educate students so that they can come out and do jobs for all of you here. And for Mayor Carl Gulak, I know one difference for you today is that you can't go to Costco anymore. <laughs> You're right. My wife doesn't like to take me to Costco or Sam's because I usually get stopped, and people want to talk about the city. Always positive, but it's, uh, it's very busy. That, ladies and gentlemen, has been our Overland Park Year in Review, and that is the time that we have. Please give a round of applause to our mayor and our industry experts. I'd like to bring back to the stage now the chairman of the chamber, who, in his little spare time that he has, <laughs> goes, becomes the CEO of St. Luke's South Hospital. Please welcome back to the stage, Bobby Olm Shipman. And, and why Bobby is coming up here, I would just like to take a second. If you can all help me, thank Nick. Nick has a busy job, he has a lot of things to do, but for him to take time out and all the panelists to come up here, we appreciate all of it. Please help me thank, thank him all. You. Thank you. Thank you. I love this. Easier said than done, yes. <laughs> talk, about a, talk about an occupational athlete. Let's give it up for this guy here, this is amazing. <laughs> Chief, you might have a Sign that guy up. You yeah. might have a recruit. Um, I would like to say thanks to the mayor and all the panelists for the report on the state of the city. We share so many priorities and are so proud as a chamber to be your partner, so thank you. We are fortunate to live and work in a community with a team of strategic, visionary leaders like you, the city council, and city staff. We appreciate that great cities don't just happen. As the mayor and others have said, it takes intentional leadership to create them every single day. Thank you for being those leaders. Again, a special thanks to today's presenting sponsor, St. Luke's Health System. Thank you to our corporate partners, Advent Health, Black & Veatch, Central Bank of the Midwest, Empower Retirement, HCA Midwest, Menorah Medical Center, Overland Park Regional Medical Center, Sprint, and all of our corporate sponsors and leadership circle sponsors for their support of the chamber. Thank you to the Convention Center for the great lunch and great service. Thanks to all of you for joining us today and for all you do to make Overland Park prosper. That's hashtag YWOP Chamber and we're adjourned. Oh. That's uh, very impressive. No, nobody Thanks got a hand. Yeah, thank right you. Yeah. You did it. <laughs>